Good morning, beloved. Peace be with you. Today is during our, this Palm and Passion Sunday. We begin, officially begin Holy, our Holy Week celebrations. And uh, what we have just read together, especially this Gospel of the Passion of our Lord, we will celebrate this Holy Week, but even slower. We'll slow it down, go into a lot of detail, and really break up this one long Gospel that we read and um, break it up into over uh, three days. And so Holy Thursday, we'll have uh, the Last Supper and broken down in detail with the foot washing. Uh, Good Friday, we'll have this Passion reading again, but from John, and really just focusing on uh, his crucifixion, his death, the glory, uh, the reverence that we have for the cross, the tool that was used to, uh, for him to um, suffer upon and give us our, grant us forgiveness. And then we wait silently as he's in the tomb Saturday until late Saturday night um, after sunsets when we uh, begin to celebrate his resurrection. So I'd encourage you just um, to take time this week to really focus and enter into these celebrations. These are basically the most important celebrations we have um, that, that help us enter into and realize what it cost for our salvation and what it cost Jesus uh, in order for us to be forgiven. And uh, it's very important to, to let that hit us and sink in and never, so we never forget it, never take it for granted. Um, because it's meant, it's not just about what he has done for us, but what he has done for us is meant to draw out a response of what, what we're supposed to do for him. And so when we, when we see, uh, we want to just really emphasize and make sure we realize that when God, when we talk about the gospel and how God loves us and forgives us of our sins, it's not just a saying or like, you know, oh, God loves you and he forgives you. Don't worry about it, you know. Just, just start over tomorrow and it's all good. Like, like. He, this is what he had to do in order to say, I forgive you. In order, in order for God to continue to be a just God, the Bible tells us that uh, sins can only be forgiven by the shedding of blood. And so in order for God to say, I forgive you, what we heard last, last Sunday, remember? Those, those two lines are, that summarize the gospel when God says, in the new covenant or this new testament, I, will re- I forgive all your evil doing." And I will remember your sins no more. But in order for him to be able to say that and still be a just God, in order for our sins and our evil doing to be forgiven, for him to remember them no more, blood has to be shed. And thus, and so he sends Jesus to say, here's what I'm going to do so that I can say, I forgive you. And we really want to enter into it and let it hit us. And so it continues to change our hearts, to direct our hearts more to Jesus. And it, and it draws a response. We, we always say the sign of the cross is a sign of God's love for us. And when somebody says, I love you, if you don't say I love you back, boy, it gets pretty awkward, huh? And, and this is God screaming out, I love you. And what are we going to say back? What's our response going to be? You, you, when someone says I love you, you really can't just be like, oh, yeah, you too, you know. That don't hit at home. That don't, that don't mean it. When you say, I love you too, and you look in the eyes. And we want to look at this response that's meant, that the passion is meant to draw out of us uh, today by looking at an example that we had at the very beginning of our gospel passage, so easy to gloss over. Uh, But this, this woman in Bethany who broke that alabaster jar and poured it out over Jesus's head, um, Jesus said she was doing this in anticipation of his burial. So she was already thinking about what he was going to do and go through and how he was going to die. And she already began to respond to his passion even before the passion. And so we want to look at this example because this is the example that we must follow if we're really uh, experiencing the gospel. So let's, I want to read it again because it's, we had a long gospel. It's very easy to gloss over and forget. And this is the only day we hear this read at Mass. The next time you will hear this passage read at Mass will be three years from now. So uh, I want to read it again just so it's fresh. And then we'll say a few, just a few more comments about it. But at the very beginning of our gospel today, it's a gospel from Mark, chapter 14. And we, we heard... It said, when Jesus was in Bethany, reclining at table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, 
costly, genuine spikenard. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indignant. They said, why has there been this waste of perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days wages and that money given to the poor. And they were infuriated with her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Amen, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I just soaked that last line in because we, we see that Jesus is elevating what she has done to the same place as the gospel and saying this must also accompany the gospel message. We've talked in here very, the last couple of years about how we can't just teach the gospel and preach it or proclaim it. We also have to accompany it with signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances, according to Jesus Christ. But according to Jesus Christ, here is another thing that must accompany our gospel message. We, we must also mention what this woman did. Jesus says, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So, so from that moment on forever, Jesus elevates her response to the gospel message, her response to his passion, death, and burial to the same place as the gospel. Because the gospel is meant to produce this same response in each one of our lives. And she's the first one that gives us an example. So let's look at uh, just really briefly what she did because that's how we're supposed to respond. So we see she, he's in, in Bethany, reclining at table, the house of Simon Leper. Mark does not tell us who the woman is, but if we read in the Gospel of John, John identifies the woman as Mary, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus. So this was Mary, the sister of Martha, sister of Lazarus. In John's Gospel, uh, Lazarus has just been raised from the dead. And now basically they're celebrating at the house. And you remember the first time we encountered Mary and Martha, Martha was working her butt off. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha got really mad. Jesus, tell her to help me. And so actually that tells us, uh, here, here again it says that Martha is serving. Whereas Mary, in John's gospel, here he, she pours it over his head. In John's gospel, she's still sitting there at the feet of Jesus and pours this perfumed oil at the feet of Jesus. The fact that Martha is serving, and she's the only one, that's why she's getting so mad, tells us they were not very wealthy. They had no servers, no helpers. They had to do it all themselves, even when they had a special guest coming over like Jesus. So... Whatever this alabaster jar of perfumed oil that they tell us is worth more than 300 days wages, this was probably basically her life savings. You know, people do this today, but especially back then, they didn't have banks like we do where you can make some good interest and dividends and all that stuff. So you bought stuff with your money that was valuable, and then when you needed it, you could sell it and get the, get the cash. Just like today when people buy gold or silver or put their money in diamonds or they put their money in real estate, you know, you put your money in a thing instead of just in, in, in the bank. This was probably one of those things. Her, basically, her whole life savings was probably right there in that jar. And so when she takes this and breaks it and pours it over his head, 
or in John's gospel, pours it over his feet. She's pouring out her whole life savings, her whole life upon Jesus. And look at this response. The immediate response, it says in here, of some, and John's gospel, he blames it on Judas. And in Matthew, Matthew actually says it was the disciples, all of them. The people that were supposed to be closest to him. They respond and they, they see this, her pouring out her life upon Jesus. All she has in anticipation of his burial. And their response, they get infuriated, indignant with her. And they say, why this waste? Why are you wasting this on Jesus? I mean, let that start to sink in. Wasting something on Je Jesus is not worth 300 days wages. Jesus is not worth wasting her life upon. Shows you how they value Jesus. And they are, it says they are infuriated with her. How much do you make in a year? <laughs> How much do you make in a year? Who would be infuriated if you dropped that in five seconds in a collection basket, in, the, in a homeless person's hands? Imagine, you, walk, you leave here, you go down the street, down the fifth street over here, you find the first homeless person you can, and you put in their hands one year of your salary. Who would be indignant and say something to you? Who would be mad? Who would tell you that was a waste? Maybe, you, maybe, maybe we would say it to ourselves. <laughs> I mean, how many of us think if we give $5, it's wasted? Let alone a whole year of your salary. That's what this woman did. That's how the disciples responded. Why this waste? I remember when I, when I was leaving Qualcomm, sent a message out saying bye to everybody. I'm going to join the priesthood. Start seminary. See what happens. It was the Christians of different denominations at Qualcomm that were the most infuriated. That I got all the pushback from. Not, not one non-Christian said, what are you doing? That would be a waste of life. Catholicism, the priesthood. I got more uh, encouragement from non-Christians at a secular workplace, even high-level managers and corporate leaders, because I was willing to take a chance and give my life to service of the church than from the different Christians and the different denominations. Here the disciples are doing the same thing. Why this waste? How many of us have said it? I have to say, I've laughed about it myself at times. The little saying we have, that some, there's, that's around in the Catholic Church sometimes. Anytime a young man, halfway good looking, joins a seminary, becomes a priest, and we see the chuckles are already coming, and we say, oh, Father, what a waste. <laughs> Father, what a waste. And it was, it's funny until you put it in this context here. And, and we realize, oh, man, what are we really saying? That's not even a funny joke anymore. We're saying he's wasting his life on Jesus. Like the disciples were saying, she was wasting her life on Jesus. That, that's not even a... It was funny until I put it, the connection together. Wow, that, that's not funny to say, even joke about someone's, yeah, you're wasting your life on Jesus? As if he's not worth our whole life? This is, this is what she's giving us. But remember, put, our, put ourselves in her shoes. She's basically the only one paying attention. Jesus has not kept this a secret from the time of the transfiguration 
all the way as a journey to Jerusalem. From that moment on, he continued to say over and over again, we're going to Jerusalem. And when we get there this time, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed and arrested and falsely accused and condemned and crucified and die. But I will rise after the third day. He's been repeating this. And so she's like the only one. Mary is like the only one paying attention. Here they are in Jerusalem. And she knows this is it. This is the end. If you've ever had to experience someone you love dear, deeply and dearly, a spouse, a parent, I hope not a child, dying in the hospital, and all the word is, all the news is, this is the end. Say, you can say your goodbye while you can. You pour your life out, if you haven't already. And you'll stay in that hospital all day and all night, every moment, and you don't care about food anymore, you don't care about sleep anymore, you don't care about your work anymore, you don't care what anybody says or thinks or if they agree, you're there to pour your life out upon the one you love, and that is Mary with Jesus. She's holding nothing back because she might not get another chance. Because he told her, this is it, when we go to Jerusalem. You and I, we're not, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Today is all we have. We might not be able to pour our life out for Jesus tomorrow. We can't say, well, tomorrow, well, after I get a better car, after I get a better house, after I have more children, after I get married, after I save up more money, after I get a better job, after, we, we can't say after. We're not guaranteed after. The only chance we have is today. After this, no one, no one was able to pour their life out upon Jesus. No one. They weren't even, they did not even get to anoint his body after he died. When they got to the tomb, he was already risen. This was it. Today could be it. The, the last chance to pour your life out for Jesus. No wonder Jesus said, this, is, this has to be talked about with the gospel. This is the response, the proper response of the gospel. When you see and experience me pouring out my life for you, that you would pour out your life back to me. That's the response. That's what we call communion. When you receive the Eucharist, that's, that's what you're supposed to be saying. Jesus is pouring out his life, his body and blood, soul and divinity into your hands as you're about to receive. How are you pouring your life out to him to have that true experience of communion?